getting bigger by being better. The number one choice for Bristol. This is GCFM 93.2. One of the recurring themes here on The Politics Show is the growing power of money over our courts and our media, whether our society delivers justice and what we see and hear in our national discourse with Ken Clark's legal aid cuts. It now costs thousands of pounds just to challenge a former employer, for example, for unfair dismissal. While we have hundreds of digital channels, our mass media seems to be more and more remote from wider public concerns and owned by those who in some ways don't represent us. Meanwhile, the internet has enabled almost anybody to make a film, and if it's good enough for it to be seen all over the world by as many people maybe as would have seen it on the old mainstream tv but how much can we trust about what we see on the internet or is that a good thing that we should actually work out for ourselves who's telling the truth and who isn't so rather than harping on as we usually do about this and the miscarriages of justice uh, or other stories which have been misreported or not reported at all tonight we look at the structural changes in investigative journalism over the last 30 years or so since the explosion of tv channels and the so-called digital revolution I'm joined in the studio by two journalists you might never have heard of, but they're two of the hardest-hitting journalists in this region. One is the writer Phil Chamberlain, senior journalism lecturer at the University of the West of England, who, with Dave Smith, has just produced a book called Blacklisting, The Secret War Between Big Business and Union Activists. Hi, Phil. Hello. And also, the other is uh, author and film producer Tim Tate, who's made documentaries for ITV and other organisations uh, high and global satellite channels in fact including the banned conspiracy of silence about child sexual abuse in the US Republican Party and has written books on child sex abuse as well. Hi Tim. Hello. Um, we asked them both then <laughs> is investigative journalism dead? Welcome gentlemen. Uh, Phil can we start with you? What, what's your answer to that basic question? Uh, no I think uh, far from being dead I think it's uh, uh, healthy, uh, vibrant it's just morphed into lots of different types of forms so we may have wanted to take a pulse of one body a few years ago I think now we've got uh, investigative journalism existing and mutated into a number of different forms um, so we've got our, uh, our pulse beating in a number of different ways which I think is quite exciting OK, uh, what, which different ways? Obviously there's the internet, is yeah. that it? Well, I think yeah, that's uh, quite a broad, even just kind of saying the internet, you're broadcasting uh, on radio, but on, online as well. Um, we're thinking about you know, within Bristol, just on its own, Bristol Cable uh, launching uh, with a remit to uh, investigate stories, um, not part of the mainstream media, however, however you may define that, but something that's welled up from below. Um, you're looking at uh, people producing films independently, being broadcast uh, uh, online or shown in uh, community centres elsewhere. Um, it obviously still exists in network television, uh, perhaps not to the same degree as it may have done, but the audience has moved, and and so have the platforms uh, as well. But I think in whichever way you're looking at it, whether it's uh, NGOs producing their investigative work, um, individuals producing their investigative work, or the classic um, uh, national newspaper group of three or four journalists working on a story, I think it still uh, exists there in a number of different forms. OK. Uh, how would you define investigative journalism, I and mean, how would you define the mainstream media? You were asking that question yourself. It's not an easy one, is it? Yeah, I mean... I I, there's, um, so which questions do you want to ask first? Uh, okay, yeah, investigative journalism, how do you define that? Well, I think, um, so there's a quote from Paul Foote, or I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially Paul Foote, um, Daily Mirror journalist, ex-Daily Mirror journalist, ex-Private Eye uh, reporter, uh, and investigative journalist, I think, uh, I'd hope we'd all kind of agree around this, uh, around this table, someone who works on a number of different issues, miscarriage of justice, down to the classic... Um, well, he was a, a hero of mine, I have to say. Oh, I, mean, I think, you know, yeah, I mean, if as an, as an ideal of someone that you want to to, to, to work towards, I think, uh, you know, is, 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 is brilliant. And he's... He said that all, all journalism should be investigative journalism. Uh, journalism should be about something that someone doesn't want uh, you to print. Um, and it's a nice ideal, I think, to say that all journalism should be. But that's, that's such a broad term. Um, there's nothing wrong with um, there's something very right about attending a council meeting and reporting about the events that took place. Is that investigative? Um, I don't think so. Is it journalism? Yes, it is. And it's important. I think investigative journalism, what separates it out, you could say, would be about its impact on society would be about the stakes are high i would suggest with it that the time taken to carry it out is often much longer um there's much more investment required um it reveals something which otherwise is hidden um for which there's no evidence other than that you've dragged out i think it requires original 
research as opposed to rehashing other people's work. There are a number of different ways, but I'm, I'm going to put those up as a, as a rough way of separating out what we might call investigative from um, other journalism. Because you can sometimes, can't you, find two stories, maybe done by two completely separate people, but you put them together, you get another mm. completely different impression, and that's quite a, a difficult task as well. Uh, also, uh, 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 Tim Tate, maybe y- y- you could share with us what your thoughts are about defining investigative journalism and whether you think <coughs> it's dead. I mean, is it, it, it? Clearly, there is some going on, but well, what's your view? I don't think it's dead. I just don't think it's very well. Yeah, it's, that Phil's nodding there. <laughs> no, no, I just—I just, I like the medical analogies we keep going. So. <laughs> it, it's actually dying, and it's dying because it's being starved. I share with Phil pretty much that analysis of what investigative journalism is. I differentiate between reporting and and investigative journalism. Reporting is, as you say, going along to a council meeting. It's providing the facts. Investigative journalism is digging up something largely that someone doesn't want you to dig up. It's digging up evidence, solid evidence, not opinion, evidence, and it is challenging it says, this is wrong, this is the person who is responsible, I will ask those questions of him or her. We used to have an immensely healthy tradition of that in Britain. We don't have that anymore. What we have is an awful lot of babble, an awful lot of rooftop shouting from correspondents, merely repeating what the news desk has told them to say, we have less and less inquiring journalism and I think there are systemic reasons for that but above all I think that is a very very dangerous thing for our democracy. Well why is it so dangerous Tim? It goes back to the (coughs) classic problem of the United Kingdom. We don't have a written constitution, we have a constitutional arrangement by which there are crudely four branches of power there's the executive, that's whoever's in number 10 at the time. There's the legislative, that's the Houses of Commons and Parliament. There's the judiciary, obviously the courts. The fourth estate is the media, the press as it used to be called. Each one of those is there under our slightly wobbly constitutional table to keep an eye on the other one, to act as a break on the other one's power. If you take one of those legs away, that table is going to wobble and eventually fall over. And what has happened is we have dumbed down and reduced the inquiring watchdog nature of the fourth estate. Phil, uh, Tim's there saying that we've dumbed things down. What you're saying is actually that we've spread things out. There's more going on. But I I think, paraphrasing what Tim's saying, he's saying, (coughs) although there's more stuff out there, it's a babble and it's difficult to actually make sense of. Yeah, it's probably two things. And um, I think... um uh, taking on this point about the, the going to the, the council meeting to, to report and then asking the difficult questions so that, uh, as Tim raised I think there are two points that come out of that one is asking the difficult question that requires um, courage um, it requires um, a commitment and someone to back you up to ask that if you ask difficult questions of people who have authority and power you need to have the support to be able to do that um, and Tim also said about digging out evidence I think absolutely right. Um, I think what tends to be a character is is a mass of evidence for story. The the, the classic iceberg that ninety percent of what you've gathered um, is you know lies behind the ten percent that actually makes it onto whatever platform you've produced. Um, and doing that requires um, resources um, and the the uh, economic setup at the moment doesn't feel doesn't quite often want to resource in the mainstream media um, investor reporting because it annoys people who have power and who have expensive lawyers and it takes a long time and sometimes it doesn't produce anything even if um, you know there's something there but you're not quite able to stand it up so it requires a commitment of courage and resources I think you would say and in these times where um, the BBC has to increasingly um, Justify uh, what it's going to do along uh, commercial grounds. Investigative journalism is uh, is a, is a t- you know is, is requires uh, is, a, is a bet you know is a, something they uh, sometimes don't wish to bet on. I think you would say so. Um, that's I think part of the issue uh, about why there's a problem at the moment. What I'm interested in is that the, that still stories find their way out. That people aren't. Um, 
uh, willing to accept that there isn't any other way of reporting it and finding and developing their own means of telling those kind of stories? I'm going to disagree with pretty much most of what you're, you've said and you're going to say, I suspect. Okay, evening. cool. I think you can date the malaise in investigative journalism very, very precisely. It dates back to a single documentary film on ITV called Death on the Rock. For those old enough to remember, it was a, a Thames television production which accused the government of ordering a shoot-to-kill policy for suspected IRA terrorists on Gibraltar. It incensed Margaret Thatcher. This is not supposition, this is fact. It incensed her so much that she said, I am going to change the way that British television operates. And in doing and in doing her, she was absolutely determined that there would not be another death on the rock. It took a while for that to happen, but what she did was change the structure, the very delicate ecosystem of British broadcasting to ensure that there would be less and less investigative journalism. So how did she do that? It's pretty simple. Before Death on the Rock, and until very shortly thereafter, if you wanted to have the franchise to broadcast in ITV, because ITV was then a system of 15 regional companies, you had to bid for it, and you had to bid both on financial grounds, but you also had to bid on quality grounds. There was a quality threshold. And you had to say, to get this license from you, the government, I will broadcast X number of programmes which are strongly journalistic, X number of documentaries, X number of arts, history, religious films. There was a written-down, legally binding contract which says this is what I will do. Thatcher abolished that. Once the quality threshold was gone, it was pretty simple for ITV companies to look at this and say, you know, I don't really need to do this anymore. And successive governments have removed every last piece, every last requirement for ITV to broadcast anything other than what they choose to broadcast. What they choose to broadcast, though, by and large is bread and circuses, it's entertainment shows, because that's where the money is, that's where the, ab the audiences are, the big audiences are, and that's therefore where the advertisers are. That's great, but it's not public service broadcasting. Once ITV began to pull away from that, Channel 4 said, we don't have to do that. And they started filling their schedules with property porn instead of serious programmes. Once Channel 4 and ITV had done that, the BBC <coughs> came under greater pressure. Well, you're not getting the huge audiences. Why do you have the licence fee, which is a tax? Because you're not giving the people what they want. The result is that there has been a significant and continual lowering of the bar, so that whilst investigative programmes do get through, they're frankly now rarer than hen's teeth broadcasting doesn't exist on its own it affects newspapers this is a symbiotic relationship the whole thing has folded in on itself but, but tim what you're ignoring there is what phil's pointing out which is uh, the absolute explosion on the internet i mean for example even a film that you made that was banned by a discovery channel on international television has found it onto the internet there it is and that's great. I have no problem with that, though I didn't send it to the internet. I would stress, in case Discovery's lawyers might be listening. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is that, that is never, ever, ever going to fill the gap, and there are two reasons. The first is what Phil's alluded to, which is a financial thing. I've spent most of the 37 years I've been in this trade as an investigative journalist. An investigation takes time and money. The funding is not there to do this on the internet. No one's investing that money in it. Therefore, it isn't going to get done. Or if it's done, it's done by lone wolves, people who say, well, I'm going to do this because I care enough to do it and I'll, find, I'll figure out how to put food on the table later. That's the first problem. The second problem is there is a, a myth that is peddled that... 
audiences, consumers, as they're now called for investigative journalists, have migrated away from the mainstream media to the internet. And do you know what? There isn't a single piece of empirical evidence to show that to be true. Phil, what do you make of that? Because it, I think Tim's making a pretty strong case. He's saying that it's simply, <coughs> it's simply not the money to fund these investigations, especially when you know they may they may you may have a whole team of people plus a barrister working on something for a, uh, a, a week or a month or even longer, and then find well we can't actually broadcast it. There's simply not the money around to do Which that. Which is what right. I said earlier. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's the, I mean I don't I think we're not disagreeing on oh, that. No, we're agreeing on yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That, that's what makes it is that it, they are complex, and therefore you have to um, you, you require a, 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 someone's got to take a punt on it. You know, so, I mean it's not it's not going to uh, the fact that it may not even produce something to air because at the last stage something comes up, it doesn't quite come together. That's the the property prawn you talked about absolutely i know it's going to happen it's a safe bet for me to invest in so that's why they're going to go for it I, I, absolutely i i agree um i think that the um there are a couple of things there one is about the idea of the lone wolves i think actually there have always been kind of lone wolves and i think actually and i think that's i part don't think there's any problem with lone wolves i would largely class myself as one yeah. but I, I, I suppose you're saying in the, in the babble of voices, actually, it's difficult to get them to get the herd, and there's a to get a herd in that way. Um, that's about nature of trust, I think, and the factoring of audiences and where people get information from. Um, uh, you're specifically talking about um, uh, public serving broadcasting and dating it to the death on the rock. This is um, quite a, a you know a kind of well established kind of case about how Margaret Thatcher took a revenge on on someone having the temerity to question um, their actions. Um, and there obviously has been a, uh, a decline. In them. If you want to just count up the programmes that are no longer with us, you know we can all reel off a couple uh, ourselves. Um, but they still exist. I mean, Panorama still comes out on on a, on a weekly basis. Are you going to reach for a piece of paper now? Yeah, well, so I, 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 what I was going to do is I'm going to read out the, the, the list that Tim sent me of the uh, ten different um, investigative programmes. I think these were apart from First Tuesday were weekly. Uh, Panorama, Brass Tax, Inside Inside Story, World in Action, First Tuesday, World in Action Viewpoint. is um, World in Action been replaced by tonight. Uh, viewport, the Cook Report this week on ITV dispatches and secret history, and I would uh, add to that rough justice <coughs> as well. Yeah, that's well, there's one. a difference actually. I think there's an interesting one about miscarriage of justice as a, as a specific strand. I think actually that's that's not being done. That's been done hardly anywhere. Um, miscarriage of justice, and I think there's a whole interesting thing going on about the criminal cases review commission um, about um, there's there's. This, there's a wider discussion thing about miscarriage but they're not being covered in the same way it used to be if you're investigative you weren't one until you had a miscarriage of justice thing under your belt do you know what I mean and they don't not pursued in that same way um, and uh, the last one I saw of being overturned was actually partly as a result of work by students at uh, uh, an incident project at uh, the University of Cardiff it was interesting what's coming out of that as opposed to from uh, uh, from the mainstream media as such uh, the programmes or pro um, outlets have always um, uh, arisen, flourished, and moved on again. Um, there are uh, outlets from the 19th century which did amazing stuff, and they're along with us. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen on print. There are radio uh, programmes which used to produce stuff and are no longer with us. They're in different kind of forms. Um, there is a decline in the totality number. The Cook Report is no longer with us. Uh, there are a number of programmes which still look at consumer issues. Cook Report is very much that, you know, the, the, the person overturned by a kind of company or something. That They're picked up by different programmes. World in Action is no longer... Uh, uh, is, there, is there left on network? Absolutely. But um, it's still there on a regular basis. Has the threshold, the public service threshold, been lowered? Absolutely. I, was, um, I would agree with that. But, again, we're looking at a quite a narrow kind of focus. And, indeed, if I look on my programme guide, if I pull my programme guide up and I see Made in Bristol at number eight, it's a kind of local TV station as well. But also, if I scroll a bit further down, I see Al Jazeera with the whole investigations unit producing material. I can tune in to, um, to CNN. I can tune into a number of other places as well. So I think um, pre while these programmes would have been on, that would also have been the same time um, because I'm not that far off from Tim as well we're having a fourth channel was still something of a luxury on uh, on television um, actually I've now got now there's the classic 50 channels and nothing on but there's a there's actually been a broadening of uh, the number of channels open let's, as well let's just have a look at the cook report specifically because this is one mm -hmm. of the things that I find just I'm mind-boggling mm -hmm. 10 million viewers a, a week he was pulling in and there was a scrap with the news of the world a legal scrap I mean if a current affairs program like that <coughs> effectively a kind of uh, journalistic sting operation <laughs> um can pull in 10 million viewers why aren't uh, the the uh, the networks doing that still 
Yeah, that's a, sorry, go, Sam, you're, I'm sorry, Dominic. Well, I mean, I should declare an interest. I used to work on the Cook Report, and I worked with Roger for many years, and did his last. Uh, major fee- film for ITV in 2007 and I can tell you exactly why the networks don't want that type of journalism and I can give you cast iron examples of what they say when you offer them to it to them because that's what I do for a living they don't want it because you have to spend a lot of money this stuff ain't cheap to make you equally have to spend a lot of money on lawyers Ugh. And the lawyers are even more expensive than the programmes in many cases. I, you mentioned Jazeera, I worked for Jazeera as well for four years. I'm, I finally made a film, for one of the films I made for them was an hour-long investigation into Boeing. <coughs> Boeing's a 58 billion a year company. It's the second biggest aircraft company in the world. It's a pretty big target. I had thousands of documents and whistleblowers showing that Boeing had knowingly put 1,600 of the most commonly used passenger planes up in the sky with parts which its own paperwork showed to be unlawful and ill-fitting. I took that first to dispatches at Channel 4, and dispatches is what it claims to be the investigative current affairs programme on television. The commissioning editor for dispatches then said... And I quote in an email, you can't make these sort of allegations about a well-respected international company. Now, leaving aside the fact that's what investigative journalism should do, he didn't ask, have you got the evidence? He just said, you can't do it. Now, we did make the film, I made it for Jazeera, and it was shown around the world, and I hope it has made a difference. It worries me when you have a commissioning editor for a soi-disant investigative flagship program who says you can't really accuse big companies of doing something wrong that man he's no longer the commissioning editor there he's now a senior executive in charge of programming advice which is one of the sprouting internet-based organizations has he carried that same attitude across to this if so it doesn't bode well for the internet picking up what we used to do uh, also, Phil, I, mean, you know, I know you've just in the process of, I'm not sure if it's been published yet, doing this book about uh, blacklisting called Blacklisted. It's, uh, been, it's can, been published published two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, can, <clears throat> can you tell us how that, that process went? Whether, was it re- Obviously, you put a lot of time and effort into writing the book, but how about getting it published? Was that an easy process? Um, I, well, I... I uh, it's my first book, so uh, it, I don't know whether that's the yardstick to test uh, by all publication books. There are probably experts out there that have had uh, easier and, and tougher journeys than, uh, than Dave and I did. Um, uh, was it easy to get published? Uh, the contract was easy to do. Was it easy to get past the lawyers? No, it wasn't. But then you are um, investigating 44 of the largest construction companies in the UK and accusing them of systematic human rights abuse. You're going to get some kind of pushback on that. Good. I mean, <laughs> r- and rightly, frankly, I would be a bit disappointed if we hadn't actually. Because you wonder about whether you're not asking the right questions. To be honest, <laughs> um, I, I think it's. Uh, uh, I, can, I can go back blacklisted. That, that's fine. Um, I'd Sim raised an interesting point there. I mean, do you not see it as a the, the, the fact the film still got made, so it still gets heard and broadcast? Uh, you know he or she that person you know kind of um personalized or something makes probably what we think is a, a wrong call on that for whatever reason um it still gets kind of published d- 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 but do you think in which case i would be concerned if every um every time i saw that particular program i'm not i'm not here paid to be an advocate for network television by any stretch of the imagination but um on the other hand there are corporations that are hit by these programs every now and again and therefore um, it's as if they always kind of back off. Now, you could say in a kind of Chomsky's way that um, that just merely proves the system is working by every now and again correcting a, a small dysfunctional part because it proves that the oversight is working. We can get into that kind of meta-analysis if you wish, but, you know, they, they do actually every now and again manage to kind of take on some of the big boys. Um, I have a lot of patience for Al Jazeera, not just because I worked for them for four years. Yeah. I think they do fantastic work. The big question is not whether Al Jazeera is doing great work, and it is. The question is, why have we got 
a situation where public service broadcasting in this country relies on a Doha based network to do our job for us and just to pick that point up just before we came out I picked up <coughs> the 40 most recent programmes that Dispatches for whom I also used to make films broadcast Rice how safe is our food are you addicted to your doctor no benefits Britain the British property boom if that is investigative journalism I am a banana uh, Phil what do you think I mean the list the list that Tim's read out there does that fit into your category of investigative journalism well it's a three out of uh, 40 but um, uh, I think uh, there has been a change isn't there I think about kind of ideas about consumer reporting and if anything about that I think the Cook Report is part of that to be honest you know about what classes as investigative about taking on kind of consumer issues I'm not going to def- I'm not going I'm not here to defend one way or the other but I think there have been a change in taste that go on as well there have been pa- plenty of other programmes that they've done which have tackled far more serious subjects uh, you know however you may wish to define that well, actually well, I think well, that actually think that could you probably just name you say, a couple of them so, no I don't have to well so I'm, I'm interested about benefits britain for instance one being a multi-billion pound industry which affects um millions of people in this country yeah i think that's probably something that's worth investigating yeah um, i mean also one of the big stories right now is this um child uh, sexual abuse okay. scandal whitehall westminster scandal yeah and uh, has, we have and had actually, we have had actually, a bit that's that. interesting actually because um I, I, first of all i think we need to kind of take the internet as some kind of warehouse somewhere with some wires going in and out of it it's far too simplistic as being described um actually we've got a number of different um uh being viewed on a number of different platforms produced a number of different ways across audio across um, uh, uh, across uh, online or being um known as online radio and all sorts of different kind of platforms and one of the drivers for this current um, uh, investigation around uh, child sex abuse is an outfit called Exaro News which is online only um, and is uh, led by a chap called Mark Watts uh, who is comes from the traditional and put my kind of air quotes up and stuff print, print media and stuff and has gone on t- online it's trying to work out a business model that will that will work Zara's done some uh, incredible work uh, in pushing this and asking questions and taking the time to um, to investigate to take on some of the hits um, quite often in conjunction with um, papers like the Sunday People uh, as well I think there's a, that's one of the interesting but there's a tension, developments there's a tension there Phil isn't there because we also had Newsnight spiking the story which was the uh, Jimmy Savile mm. uh, w- witnesses and uh, people who had been abused by Savile were yeah. uh, spiked Liz McKean who uh, yeah. did the interview has, how do you now, know, how do you has now left how do you know this how do you know about being spiked? Well, he was he, he the, the the program wasn't played because yeah, no, how do apparently you, how, how do you know that? It well, wasn't? because a bit of investigative journalism, right? Okay, so yeah. uh, you know, the, it, this stuff doesn't kind of lie under a rock and it's kind of hidden away secretly. The, no, the the BBC in that case made a monumental error for which they have been roundly kind of cast anyway, chastised. Well, I'm trying well, no, to no, no, the point is, is, is that you only know that because other journalists are kind of asking those questions about it. Well, I and mean, Zaro to be News fair, and hold on a second, and Zaro News is one of those that's uh, pulling out the um, the the the. the Error in not kind of um, in not kind of pursuing that. It's been kind of corrected elsewhere. And also, to be fair, Miles Gosler, who wrote wrote up the story of what happened at Newsnight, had gone around all the mainstream newspapers in London and failed to get it in. Eventually, it went out in the the Oldie magazine. But anyway, look, this is a subject that Tim's covered in in his uh, documentary uh, <coughs> uh, "Conspiracy of Silence" in the US. So let's hear mm-hmm. a little clip from that now. A very short clip from Tim's film. You literally have to have bricks for brains to take on the FBI in this country and that's exactly what you'd have to do to do this properly they now in my opinion in my investigation are the architects of the cover-up we asked the fbi for an interview about its investigation of the franklin scandal larry holmquist with the fbi here we feel it would it would be inappropriate for us to comment we work this with the omaha police department we just don't feel it would be appropriate for us to make comments as the phone slammed down by the FBI there. Uh, Tim, how is making that film, um, uh, uh, um, maybe you can tell us when it was made, how has it, uh, you think, effect, uh, uh, affected the way you've seen what's unfolded here with post-Jimmy Savile? Um, well, the answer to, I made the film <coughs> back in 1994 for Discovery, and Discovery funded it, and Discovery eventually, a week before broadcast, decided they weren't going to broadcast it for reasons you and I have gone into on other programmes. What I 
I would like. I think we can draw. I'd like to draw something, a, a lesson out of that, and refer to Ixaro, whom you've celebrated. Um, and I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news on this, but Ixaro has, frankly, a pretty shoddy track record on this subject. And I say that, and Mr. Watts knows because he and I have disagreed very loudly about this. To my certain knowledge, and to his certain knowledge, it has twice published stories which were factually, utterly incorrect on this, and set hairs running which had thereafter to be shot. The second point is, if you look at what Ixaro has done recently on this subject, and what it trumpets as its achievements, it has done no more than people used to do on the tabloids in the 70s and 80s. It has interviewed anonymous, anonymously someone who said, this happened to me in this place by these people who will also remain anonymous. There is no evidence in Ixaro's reporting that it has undertaken any due diligence to find out whether that's true or not. It has merely reported an allegation by an anonymous complainant against anonymous alleged offenders. I have no idea whether that's true or not, and I don't think Ixaro does either. And I will, but what I do know is that isn't investigative journalism. When I made the Franklin film, the cup the, um, that you've just played a clip from, I had, because I had the money and the time to do this, a room full of grand jury testimonies. Now, there's an element of having to own up but I'm not actually allowed to have those <laughs> but for me to support and to say to Discovery or whoever else here is somebody making this allegation I want some evidence to support it and my great worry about the Xaros of this world is all they are doing is reporting they're saying here is someone making an allegation we're not telling you whether it's true or not we're merely saying it's an allegation that's been made and we can't tell you who made it and we can't tell you who it relates to. I don't think that's investigative journalism. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, Phil, what, what Tim's saying there is, is, is again, this kind of accusation of there being too much babble out there without... I mean, in, in the no, old I days when there were only... I don't think no? he's saying that. Um, I think he's questioning the methodology behind Zara, if I'm correct, about I'm, that. You know, I'm, I'm not, I have to say, I'm not particularly blaming Zara for doing it. I think mm. it's going to be a great business model for them because mm. it was a proven business model for the tabloids, mm. the tabloid Sundays, for many <laughs> decades. <laughs> what I am saying is, don't, please confuse this with serious investigative journalism because it isn't well i mean i'm uh, again I, I feel like i'm kind of here as the paid representative for uh, investigative outlets and that's not what i'm about um what i'm interested in the fact that um it's stories forcing their way out despite um the rather narrow definition that if it's only on television and on nine o'clock at night with a single word headline that therefore it's class investigative journalism i think it's much broader than that zara is not defined by the um Sable scandal um i spoke to mark what's come down to talk to students and i'm um, actually one of the one of the cases they uh, kind of cut their teeth on, if you like, was, if I recall, about the self-employment status for senior civil servants and the way they were being paid, analysis of their kind of tax returns about how, the fact they were avoiding tax by being paid as uh, limited companies. Um, so uh, Zara can answer uh, for their own kind of methodology about how they carry out uh, investigations. Um, I think tabloids have traditionally um, deployed <clears throat> dubious methods uh, to uh, gain, and, and have always have done since uh, you know the kind of 19th century uh, about how they kind of gain stories. That's because there are different markets out there looking for um, uh, serving markets in different ways. People looking for stories um, that they feel applicable to them. Uh, not everybody is interested in. A particular type of economic story. Some people are more interested in much more, uh, much more, uh, maybe mundane matters in different ways. So uh, you know, there are different approaches, depending on which market you're you're targeting. I wouldn't expect to be able to kind of see a similar type appearing. Uh, I do think it's interesting. Zaro kind of the way it's kind of stepping up at the moment. But that's all. Tim, uh, does investigative journalism actually change anything? Good investigative journalism. Yes, it can. Um, simple, obvious examples. Watergate is the is the granddaddy of them all. Watergate changed things kind of dramatically. From my own personal experience, yes, a film that I made got the law changed. Yes, it can do, but if to do that, 
you have to have the evidence you have to have spent the time and the money assembling the evidence which makes a watertight case it's like a prosecution it's not enough just to to use the old analogy to walk into a crowded theater and shout fire you actually have to have a reasonable degree of evidence that there is a fire. Yeah, I, I, I think about going back to right back to the beginning about definitions, if it's really going to reach that, that um, satisfy our demand about what is it, then I think unless it has changed something, then is it investigative? I think ultimately, I mean, everything, everything may aspire to it, um, but until perhaps it has changed people's ways of thinking or ways of behaving... Um, then, then that might be that might be one of, de- of, of defining has, has it is it investigative? Yeah, I, I know. Well, to some extent, your listeners may think, "Oh, this is all a bit inside baseball." You know, <laughs> it's you know, what does it really matter? And I, here's why I think it matters. And the Xaro again <coughs> is a potentially good example. Again, I stress, I don't know whether the stories that Xaro are publishing are true or not, and I don't believe Xaro knows whether they're true or not they may believe them to be true but they haven't got the evidence or if they have they haven't published it what they are doing is raising public expectation and if that public expectation is not met in other words no prosecutions ensue no one is found guilty or named for it you exacerbate the growing problem which i see and i think you must see in which the public not don't, don't just distrust their media, but distrust every aspect of government. Mm-hmm. I think if you're going to shout fire, you've got to have the evidence. Although I think that's one of the arguments about Watergate, wasn't it? They were saying you were destroying trust in the government, etc., like that. But it, it had to be. Co- I, I mean, just saying but that's what gets the people. Audience. I know. I, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think Watergate's. Are we running up close to the time? Yeah, now, I was just going to mention Michael Hastings because he, he's an investigative journalist and was investigating exactly the same sort of stuff as came out in the Watergate scandal. Uh, which was the intelligence services actually spying on the government and and using also spying on him, on journalists <coughs> around that. So, so when you've got your own domestic security service mm. targeting politicians, elected politicians and journalists, you've got quite a serious <coughs> situation as they have in the US. But I'd like to wind up, guys, by asking you both, uh, if you had a 1980s-style budget for an hour-long Documentary is that with inflation? Yep, with inflation hardwired in there. Uh, <laughs> and with, expenses, please. With, with your with your with your QC sitting there there uh, <laughs> twiddling his thumbs for a week, uh, just uh, just so that you can make sure that your your program's le- legally watertight, or maybe a, a couple of weeks. But for making an hour long documentary, what sort of stuff would you like to see, uh, uh, and would you enjoy making, Phil? Um. <coughs> um I think what journalism doesn't do very well, excuse me, <coughs> what journalism does do very well with long-term trends, I, don't, I think it's very good at, at incidents that take place, and Watergate is an example of that, and then trying to work out context. I'm trying to be brief here. But so where if you've got that time, I think is to look at some long term trends. How is it that we wake up and Tesco, as was, is suddenly the biggest kind of supermarket? You know, it, it kind of creeps up on you and then suddenly you realise it's there. And so I think what would be nice to have that time to sort of track some of those long term economic trends. How is it about how a manufacturing base develops or what is it about the environment that we want to look at? Because journalism increasingly is still based around the kind of now, the event that happens now and looking at it and looking at it in a very narrow context. So if I had the time, it's a very broad answer. It's the ability to be able to track over longer term and then think about what structurally is problem with mass yeah, society. Yeah, take a step back from the story and take a longer yeah, view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into context. Not just go to the council meeting, but to think about how is it they came to the decision, for, if, you know, to extend that analogy. The why like. as well as the what. Right, right, right. Can I ask you the same question then, Tim? If you could make a, a programme, an hour-long programme, to stuck on prime time, uh, terrestrial TV, if such, such a thing still exists, really, it's all <laughs> digital now, isn't it? But here, here in Britain, what would you make? Well, I'm going to be weaselly about this because that's what I still do for a living and I'm not, I'm not actually <laughs> going to uh, announce what I would like to do next. I'm just finishing <laughs> one film at the moment. Well, I, can I ask a question instead, which is classic investigative journalism by my colleagues, former colleagues at Yorkshire Television and the Granada Television, resulted in the freeing of ten innocent men Birmingham (coughs) 6 and the Guildford 4 I ask a simple question who would do that now? Private eye Private eye? No they wouldn't it took three years for each of those teams to do that it took many hundreds of thousands of pounds Private eye can't do that Um, 
uh, a book by Chris Mullin um, involved as well. I mean, the parliamentarians. Chris Mullin was paid by World in Action. Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, I'm, I'm not decrying the efforts there. I think it would still kind of burst out. The the book that, I, that Dave Smith and I have written, uh, blacklisted, is as a result of of some uh, the Guardian. Um, primarily a little bit of the Daily Mirror doing a little bit of work but primarily the work of myself and Dave working independently with a couple of um, uh, lawyers, with a couple of uh, uh, with a number of union activists um, with some NGO help working out that work collectively and then publishing it and resulting that um, in a series of investigations that are kind of carrying on I mean, I think that stuff can still sprout out um, I just don't need to wait until I get the okay from the mainstream media to say that it's okay to investigate Time to sign off now for the Murdoch News at 7 o'clock. You were just listening to Phil Chamberlain from the University of the West of England and Tim Tate, former documentary maker for ITV. Current documentary maker, if you will. Current? Like All right, current documentary yeah. maker. Sorry. Our thinking. sister show it's dialects on Mondays at 11am. Thanks to our guests in the first hour, leader of the Lib Dems and Council on, from Noel, Gary Hopkins. Thanks also to Joe Martin from the Bristol CFM Cannabis Club and Old Labour Oxford economist Radio Martin Summers. Stephen, Stephen Sizer, the band reverend. We didn't have time for him. We'll have him next week. And we're online at thisweek.org.uk. See you at five next Friday.